every time we chant this sutta we did just now, setting the Dharma wheel in motion, I'd like to look at that wheel we have up on the wall, the one my father made years back. It's going on 13 years now. It's got 12 spokes. And it's a symbol of one of the passages there in the Dhammajaka Bhavatana Sutta, the one where the Buddha goes through the Four Noble Truths and the three types of knowledge for each truth. In other words, knowing the truth, knowing the duty appropriate to that truth, and then knowing that he completed that duty. Four truths. Three levels of knowledge. Three times four is twelve. That's the wheel in the Dharma wheel. And it should form the basic frame for the way we look at our practice. It's how we attend to things, or how we should attend to things. The Buddha never taught bare attention. He talks about only two kinds of attention. There's appropriate and inappropriate attention. Because when you attend to things, it's not really bare. The fact that you're noticing something, paying attention to something, you have a purpose in mind. Even if you decide you're going to pay attention to whatever pops up, there's still subtle choices going on. Because there are many things happening all at once, and you can't help but pay attention to one thing rather than another. And you can't help but do something about what you're paying attention to. There's a purpose, there's an intention, there's an activity that goes along with your attention. And it's important that you're very clear about this as a meditator. Otherwise, if you think you've reached bare attention, you're told that that's a taste of awakening or a taste of the deathless or a taste of the unconditioned, you stop looking. You don't dig a little deeper to say, well, wait a minute, what is going on here? What is there an element of intention here? Is this fabricated or is it not? There's a Dharma talk by John Mahabhu I was reading last night in Thai, where he says you have to test everything. Be willing to destroy everything that comes up, because it's the, whatever is really true and really unconditioned is not going to be touched by your efforts to destroy anything. Now, destroying here means that you learn how to take it apart, question it, see if you can figure out how it's formed. So there's always going to be that element in attention. When the Buddha places attention in the system of dependent core rising, it's mixed up there with contact and intention and perception and feeling. And all these have fabrication underlying them. So there's a lot going on, even when you think you're just giving bare attention to something. And one of your tasks as a meditator is to notice that, to ferret it out. And to learn how to apply appropriate attention to what's going on. What makes it appropriate is that it's framed in terms of the Four Noble Truths. And the duties appropriate to those truths. Or what you might say, the skills appropriate to those truths. Because there are activities that the Buddha encourages you to apply to the different truths. Stress or suffering is something he said you have to comprehend. Now, to comprehend means to know it so thoroughly that you develop this passion for it. We don't lose to think that we're passionate for stress and suffering, but we really are. The things we generally are passionate about carry a lot of stress with them, but we just choose to ignore that fact. And so one of the things we have to do, really have to make an effort to do, is begin to see that this, these things that we love, these things that we're passionate about, have that side to them that's stressful, 
suffering side. And then learn how to look at them with, do we can develop that sense of dispassion? The duty with regard to the cause of stress is to let it go. Letting go is also a skill. You don't just toss things out willy-nilly. You look to see where is the craving, where is the ignorance that underlies that stress. And as you do this, you have to learn how to discern what kinds of desire you want to hold on to and which ones you want to let go of. Because if you look over in the path, there's desire as part of right effort, and that you're meant to develop. The path is something you want to develop before you let it go. So that requires discernment. The duty with regard to the cessation of stress and suffering is to realize it, to verify it, to bear witness to it, not e to directly experience it. In other words, experience what it means to let go of craving, to develop dispassion for craving. This too is a skill. You will have to learn more and more as you see yourself let go of a particular craving. And notice that it really does take a lot of the burden off the mind. Because for the most part, we don't notice these things. We drop one craving, we're quick to go to the next one. In fact, that's why we drop it. We've got something better, you would think. More interesting, something new, something intriguing. You get tired of what you've been holding on to, and you go hold on to something else. Go grab at something else. There's very little time to stop and notice. Well, what is it like to let go? In what way does it decrease suffering? At the same time, there are things we have to develop. That's the path, starting with right view and going on through right concentration. And although there is a stage at the very end of the practice where you let go of the path as well, you've got to develop it in the meantime. The purpose of looking at things in this way is to have a framework for how you're going to understand your life. I want you to drop the framework where you're looking at yourself, yourself, yourself all the time. What's me? What's mine? Or what, what I've got that I don't like, what I have that I do like. Yes, you're to put those concepts aside and look at these other concepts as a way of framing things. Because there are different imperatives. If there's a me that you have to shore up, that you have to look after, then there's a the whole question of how do you feed this me? And how do you choose the food for it? And how do you make sure you have a good store of food? And how do you make sure that that store of food is going to last? And there are imperatives of getting and getting and getting. And when the world goes well and everything is smooth, the teeth of that getting aren't too sharp or too vicious. But when things get really difficult, you've got to watch out. Because the imperative to feed is not always a friendly imperative. And there's not just physical food, but also the emotional food that keeps the mind going. So if that's the framework for our attention, the, the imperatives that we're acting on can get pretty nasty. If we just look at things simply as stress, its cause, and the path of practice leading to the end of stress. Try to depersonalize everything, and then you find that there's a different set of imperatives. Instead of trying to push away your sufferings, you try to understand them. And you realize you can't understand them well until the mind is really quiet, still, alert. So you have to develop those qualities. 
so that you can begin to see what's the difference between the stress and the cause of stress, so you can apply the appropriate duty. It's like going into a room where there's a lot of smoke. You don't put out the smoke. You try to put out the fire that's causing the smoke. If you go around putting out the smoke, the fire just keeps churning out more and more smoke all the time. You never come to the end of it. Because one of our problems is we don't really understand what to do with stress. We try to let go of it, let go of it, let go of it. it doesn't. That's trying to put out the smoke. We have to work our way through the smoke to find the fire. That's what you put out. That's what you let go of, the cause of stress. So it's important that you learn how to distinguish these things. In the same way that you have to distinguish between the kind of craving that causes stress and the kind of craving that and desire that develops the skillful factors of the path. So all of this requires skill. In fact, that's one way of translating ignorance is lack of skill. And the knowledge that replaces it is clear knowing of having developed the skills. So there's a doing and a gradual perfection, gradual mastery of these different imperatives. So that once you've got the framework firmly in mind, then when things come up, you can perceive them in terms of that framework. Then you know what to do with them. So that passage in the sutta, it's a very basic one and all too often gets overlooked, but it's really the heart of the sutta is the wheel. Back in the Buddhist time, that's how they would explain putting two lists of variables against each other and then running through all the various permutations. And in this case, you've got the four truths and the three knowledges, so you just, in the sutta, you just go down the list one by one by one until you've gone through all twelve permutations. Back when they were memorizing legal texts, you find this throughout the Vinaya all these different permutations that apply to the different rules, all the different variables. So you run the variables against each other and get all the permutations out. That's called a wheel. This is why we have the wheel of Dharma. But it's also a convenient symbol for thinking about that circle that goes around the wheel. That's the framework for how you want to look at things and understand what you've got to do once you understand what experience goes where, and so you know what to do with it. This is the kind of attention that we're trying to develop. You know, what the Buddha often would say at the beginning of a Dharma talk, pay careful attention. And it wasn't just listen carefully, but also bring the right frame, framework, <clears throat> bring the right framework of thought. See how and get the most out of what he has to say. And they take that framework and apply it to your practice. As you're sitting here right now, where in the breath is stress? What quality of mind can you bring to the breath to alleviate that stress, to help put an end to it, to undercut the cause of that stress? Even just thinking in these very basic terms of how you're dealing with the breath, that's the beginning of the framework for the Four Noble Truths. And as you work with the breath, you find that you get more and more skilled at it, and you can take those skills and you turn around and start working on the mind, the different events in the mind. And then you find that this framework is going to take you far. That's why the Buddha said the most important internal quality for awakening is appropriate attention. So see if you can bring this way of looking at things to bear right here, right now, at the breath, and start getting some practice with those skills. <clears throat>